next speaker is an invited student from Stanford University at the Electrical Engineering Department. Please help me welcome Zheng Yuzhu. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, how, how long do I have? Uh, ten, ten, ten minutes less, right? Yeah. Ten minutes less, okay. So uh, thank you for uh, still being here, although I don't have any basketball video to show. Um, so this is joint work with my advisors, Peter Glynn and uh, Nick Vambos. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker because uh, we're short on time. So I'm going to start with an uh, um, overview of the power control problem in wireless communications. Then I'll talk about which will motivate a game theoretical model. And then I'll talk about the results and some intuition for both the fixed environment and random environment. The emphasis will be more on the random environment case. And then I'll conclude. So here, uh, here's the classical power control problem in wireless communication. You have a bunch of uh, well, you have a bunch of wireless communication links, each of which consists of a transmitter and an intended receiver. PI is the power used by transmitter I, and the NI is the thermal noise for a receiver I. And because you see that everybody is transmitting to everyone else, there's going to be interference. A common way for measuring the system performance, something called signal to noise interference, signal to interference ratio, uh, which is given by this uh, functional form. So here the GIJ represents the power loss or power gain between transmitter I and receiver J. And, you know, the larger the GIJ means the more influence the transmitter I exerts on receiver J. Um, and of course that depends on the topology of the underlying, underlying uh, links. Right? If transmitter I is very close to receiver J, then GIJ will be very large, otherwise it will be very small. Now with this setup, the, the classical power control problem in, in wireless communication can be phrased as, uh, you know, finding a vector P um, such that the quality of service constraints are satisfied. Specifically, that means determining this power assignment for each PI such that uh, the resulting signal to interference ratio, RI, is larger than a predetermined uh, QI. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the classical problem. And uh, in 1993, seminal paper by uh, Foschini, um, there's a very simple and elegant distributed power update scheme that you know, uh, is shown to converge to the minimum power needed to satisfy those quality of, con quality of service constraints. And uh, I mean, it also showed a bunch of other things, such as you know, necessary sufficient condition for, for when such solution exists. And ever since then, there's a long thread of research that puts all kinds of bells and whistles, looking at throughput, backlog. Now, you know how these things go, right? It's just, you know, it's building on top, top of you know, each other. So my, I'm, I'm taking sort of a different angle here. Um, if you look at this, this sort of formulation, there's actually a few issues that it, this model does not address. The first one is that there's sort of a hard constraint on quality of service. But in reality, you may not, there may not be sort of, the quality of service constraint may not be hard. Also, the cost of power, sorry, is not modeled explicitly, which is power is, of course, something important. And finally, it's not clear how the quality of service vector is, uh, is even chosen. And in fact, this is sort of getting back to the previous, the first point. And sometimes if you're, if you're able to uh, reduce your power significantly, you may be able to tolerate lower so signal to noise interference, uh, signal to interference ratio. Uh, so this sort of gets us to uh, a game theoretical model that, that could uh, potentially address these issues. And in particular, we'll impose sort of a utility structure on all the links. And here, we'll just take a simple model here, which is the cost has two components. The first one is the cost associated with power. The second one is the cost associated with uh, signal to interference ratio, which can be interpreted as inverse utility. Um, and because of that, you know, we impose some sort of natural structural assumptions here. Uh, you know, the cost is convex and decreasing. If you're not transmitting anything, you should be, you know, very unhappy. Thanks. Um, if you're transmitting a lot, then you should be very happy. Uh, with this setup, you know, it, it's sort of, sort of clear what each link at least wants to do. It wants to choose a power so that to minimize the total cost. And you realize that the signal to interference ratio depends not only on the power you choose, but also on everyone else. So it's really a game. And, uh, you know, when we have a game, we'll go with proceed with the standard solution concept, something called Nash equilibrium. Here we're talking about pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And that just means, uh, so, you know, vector, 
power vector p is a, is a pure strategy Nash equilibrium if uh, no link has any incentive to unilaterally deviate from that, that power pi. And written in math, it just means if that person unilaterally deviates, it's, it's going to get larger loss. So here I want to say uh, um, applying game theory to wireless communication is, is, uh, is not you know, something new. People have been do not doing that for at least uh, more than a decade. Uh, in particular, Professor Bashar has a giant book uh, it's really giant uh, on, on you know sort of applying game theory to wireless communication and, and and by the way in case I'm assuming this sort of understood but wireless communication is a huge field right so I'm, I'm talking about here is, is a very sim, you know very specific power control problem there's you know random access control access point selection power you know but emission control what have you um, so w w with the setup. Um, the, there's a paper that's sort of more closely related to what we're talking about here is uh, specific on this power control scheme is uh, there's a paper in 2002 which also puts some utility on this on this specific scheme and you know ever since then there's also some bells and whistles um, now what this paper doesn't do and is also what sort of tend to so there's there's a few there's a few things that uh, that that paper uh, does not address. The first thing is, in this paper as well as you know, in, in a bunch of um, follow-up papers, typically there's a, a assumption that the power is bounded, as you put exogenous bounds on the power. Um, and the second thing is, the environment is typically assumed to be deterministic. Now that's fine if uh, you're talking about you know the, you're analyzing the equilibrium for for a static game, but as soon as you, you, your perspective shifts to Characterizing the behavior of the learning dynamics in a repeated setting, which is what what we will do here, um, uh, it is important to understand you know what happens when everything is stochastic. Um, so what, what's going to happen now is I'm going to start with the simple uh, deterministic case where the noise, where the environment is determined. So for, first of all, what is the environment here? So I by environment I mean specifically the combination of the G matrix. And then, and then the noise, okay? So, you know, the G matrix determined, de is determined by, you know, the interaction between those links. If everybody's sort of moving, then the, the G matrix obviously changes, time varying. Um, so I'm gonna start with this deterministic case, uh, and then talk about the, and without assumption that the power is bounded. So, mod you know, from a modeling perspective, you, you know, when you could argue that uh, in, in life, power is bounded. And so is every so is everything else, um, but mathematically, it's, there's something interesting there if you don't assume that. And secondly, which is, uh, we will also lift the deterministic environment assumption, looking at certain, you know the, the dynamics that converge to the Nash equilibrium and characterizes stochastic stability there. Okay, so in a f fixed environment case, you know you could immediately ask those questions. Uh, you know, does there exist Nash equilibrium? So is it unique? What's dynamics for reaching that? Uh, so I'm not going to uh, get into any of the details here. So I just want to say a few things. First of all, as an important uh, concept that turns out to be useful for answering all these questions, something called uh, best response function. And what is best response function? It's exactly what you think it is. It's a function that's the best response to what everyone else is doing. Okay. In particular, um, the best response function for i, link i is its best response to everyone else. And uh, you can also similarly define the best response function for the entire system. And uh, if you do that, you can recharacterize the Nash equilibrium as a fixed point. Um, OK, so then the first result concerns the existence and uniqueness of Nash equilibrium. Uh, you know, there exists the unique Nash equilibrium, which I kind of already alluded to before. Um, so the way you prove that is, here, especially in you know, we're, we're, and just to be clear, we're not, we're the power, uh, the 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 strategy space for all the players. That is, the power is the entire um, positive real number for each uh, for each transmitter. So, to show this, we we combine two things. First is a sort of a, a, a relatively novel, customized fixed point. It looks like a Tarski fixed point theorem in a general partially ordered set, not specifically tied to this wireless communication setting. And then we'll sort of analyze 
the properties of the best response function, and that's specific to what this wireless communication. You combine these two things to kill that word of Nash equilibrium, unique, unique existence and uniqueness. So I just want to say, I'm, I'm not going to talk about you know, all the details. I mean, look, it's Friday afternoon, you know, 320. You know, uh, I mean, if you guys have trouble sleeping, I will show some slides. But uh, otherwise, so I will say a few things about you know, the fixed point um, theorem. So you know, fixed point theory is, again, it's, it's huge. Right? So it's, uh, there's a bunch of those things and each of which has a bunch of variants. Usually that depends on the, uh, the assumption you make on, of the underlying, um, the assumption you make, of, you know, if you make different assumptions about the underlying domain or the map, you get different type of uh, uh, fixed point theorems. There's Banach contraction theorem. There's also Brouwer, you know, Brouwer fixed point probably the most, most familiar to you guys, the one that you, Nash used before originally in 1951 to prove things, to prove the existence of Nash equilibrium in the finite game. Um, there's Tarski theorem, where you assume it's order, you know, there's certain order theoretical structure. It's bolded because that's sort of most relevant to our case because if you think about it, our, the domain here in our case is, uh, is, a, is a partially ordered set. I right? guess Rn, subset of Rn is partially ordered. And, and so, you know, there's a book called Fixed Point Theory, which unsurprisingly talks about fixed point theory. Um, and these two guys, I mean, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge book as well and contains everything you ever want to know or don't want to know about fixed point theory. And uh, these two guys, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the last one, but the second person, but you know, these two people have fixed their life on fixed point theory, um, as you will see once you see the book. Um, so, but it turns out that, you know, so as I mentioned before, you know, the most relevant he the fixed point theory that could be used here is Tarski theorem. And, and in fact, Tarski sort of has a large family. You know, uh, has a lot of friends. There's a bunch of variants, but again, every theorem born in the Tarski family assumes the underlying pull set is bounded. So it's still not going to work in our case. So we kind of uh, um, customize the assumptions a little bit, um, and uh, it's so this this theorem right here um, is not exactly a generalization of Tarski theorem. It's more sort of serves complementary purposes. And, you know, certain situations that uh, Tarski theorems, uh, the assumptions for Tarski theorems actually hold, but our case don't. But in in, in this case, actually, it works. Uh, and there there are, are other sort of engineering applications that uh, sort of are calling out for a, a Tarski-like fixed point theorem that operates in the unbounded space. But anyway, I've said I think I said too much on this fixed point theorem. Uh, so, and then, you know, you, you characterize some properties, you know, monotonicity. Actually, monotonicity is pretty important here. And in fact, by monotonicity, you know, it's, uh, okay, well, I'll get to that later. But the point is, you know, there's a bunch of structural properties that uh, our best response function satisfy. And the combined, combining these two things, you get the answer. You, you, get, you get, you know, you prove the existence and uniqueness of Nash equilibrium. And then, you know, once you have that, sort of natural dynamics would be a best response update. And again, best response update is, is, is what you think it is. You know, every iteration, everybody chooses best response to, its, to everyone else's uh, power decision in the previous iteration. Okay? And in fact, that's, that's a strictly speaking synchronous po best response update because every, everybody's updating. You could alternatively look at asynchronous, which by its name just means not everybody's updating. Um, and then you can show that uh, synchronous best response update converges. Asynchronous best response update also converges, provided you know they update infinitely often. I just want to, you know, based on my description of best response update, it, it's a little bit misleading in terms of what I just said because it looks, it sounds like everybody, when it, when it when it decides what power to use for the current iteration, it needs to know what everybody else power is in the previous iteration. But in fact, that's not the case because uh, everybody, all you know, every uh, you know, transmitter I needs is this sort of aggregated uh, piece of information, which it's able to get from because the receiver can sense the signal to interference ratio. All it really needs is to send that signal to interference ratio back to the transmitter, as opposed to accessing everybody's power. But anyway, that's sort of a minor point. Okay, so 
now if everybody starts doing that, you can see, as I sort of mentioned before, the, the G matrix and then the noise will be uh, time varying, right? So uh, it's, it's, so it's interesting at least to think about what, what would happen to best response updating in this, in this uncertain environment. And you know, what could characterize certain stochastic stability type of results for that, uh, for best response update. So first of all, so now let's consider the uh, random environment. Uh, so first of all, I just want to mention that the noise here can include not only the, the, the NI, which is originally the thermal noise, can actually include uh, not only the, the thermal noise, but also any external disturbances. You know, so, so someone else you know, from other, from some external systems, also, you know, walking around, disturbing you. It's not part of the system. You could also put that there. Okay, so, and I said before, the environment consists of the gain matrix G and the uh, noise. Um, and in fact, so this is sort of the whole environment, right? Each link I, so the ith component of this total environment is link I's environment, which is just, you know, everyone else's interference to him and uh, the noise. And if you think about it, there's actually a, a natural ordering on this pulse set, uh, you know, this, this pi, uh, theta i. That, that is, if you think about what, what environment is more unfriendly, right? So using that to define an ordering. Because if, if you know, the, your, your own gain is, becomes larger and the rest interference becomes smaller and, you know, the, the noise becomes smaller, then the environment is more friendly, right? And a consequence of that is, if, in, if you have in a more in a, in, a, in a nicer environment, then presumably you're, uh, you need to transmit using less power, everything else being equal. And actually, it turns out that you could uh, you could uh, show that as well. And that actually uh, gives you sort of the the the, the two uh, the, the sort of the bimontonicity of the best response function. If you fix the, you know, fix the environment, then it's, it's a monotonic function of the power. If you fix the power, it's a monotonic function of the environment. And you know, th this uh, natural ordering on link, link I's environment also induces that uh, ordering on the entire environment. Okay, so uh, I, you know, as you can see, I have 14 slides in total, so yeah. I'll be, be over. Uh, so, so we're gonna. The only assumption here. So we're we're assuming that uh, the G N is bounded. Right? That's sort of uh, natural because everything is bounded. Um, and by this discussion, that just means the environment is also bounded. Because um, you take the you can take the max and the respective min. Uh, to, and the the here we're gonna take a sort of a simple model here, which is the environment is uh, is an IID random process. With the density function on some hyper rectangle, which is here, it doesn't need to be a hyper. It could be any compact set. But you know, later on, I'm going to draw some picture that will simplify the picture. Uh, once you do that, you realize that the, the power iterates in the best response update that forms a uh, uh, Markov chain, right? Um, and the question would be, you know, what what would happen to this uh, this uh, the power iterates? Now, so in, you know, instead of it's, no, technically, I have to write out the transition kernel, this and that, measure theory, because this is sort of a general state space type you know, uh, thing. But instead, I'm just going to, well, first of all, I'm going to talk about what the results here. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to talk about what questions to ask. But I think you guys already asked yourself in your head, you know, the moment I talked about the model, which is, you know, does the Markov chain have a stationary distribution? Is it unique? What's, you know, what's the convergence? Um, and also, finally, you can ask the question: you, you care, What do you care about? One thing, at least one thing, you care about is what's the long run average of you know what's the long run average power used? Uh, is there any so the 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 average power used uh, for fixed horizon is a random variable, right? What is what kind of behavior can we say about that? Is there any high concentration thing can we uh, establish? So it turns out the answer to all these questions are positive, um, and uh, I mean I guess otherwise I wouldn't be talking about them. Here, uh, so the so first of all, you know, for the first three questions, there exists unique thing and uh, convergence, and uh, we have geometric convergence rate if the initial power is bounded, and you know, uh, you have this a high the, the average long run average power is has a high concentration, which uh, uh, decreases exponentially. The, the 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 deviation probability decreases exponentially with the number of iterations n. 
and then you know these are just whatever these are, they're just finite numbers, it depends on the parameters. Okay, so why? There are two more slides. So there's sort of two pictures that will that will sort of convince you why why you know the the Markov chain eventually mixes. The first one is you start, let's say your power, you know, this is your initial power, power point. Uh, it's an n dimensional space where n is number of links. Now, no matter where you start, after a finite number of iterations, you'll be, tra you'll be trapped in some hyperrectangle, um, you know, in n dimensional space. That's due to the bimontonicity that I just talked about. And moreover, the box, this box has the property that no matter, you know, if you were to start in anywhere in that box, you would never get out. Okay, so that's what the. Secondly, now let's say, so suppose now let's say iteration k, you get into that box. So now what's going to happen is, let's say you start at p, you know, the iteration k. In one step, you will get into, you will be able to get in anywhere around some box, around p k. Of course, you know what, what that box looks like is going to depend on where you are. You could get to anywhere. Let's suppose say you get somewhere, p k plus one. And from there, you can get into anywhere in a box centered, not centered, somewhere around that pk plus 1. And that box also depends on where pk plus 1 is. And you know, you keep going. And this sort of a propagation uh, happens, you know, it keeps happening until it's going to permeate you know, the entire room. So that's when the mixing happens. OK, I think I'm over time. So anyway, so. Uh, uh, We've essentially characterized the, the stochastic stability, and, in, and uh, this sort of indicates that you know the best response update also also is well well behaved even in presence of noise. And uh, I guess with that, I'll just take any questions. I guess I'm running out of, you know over time anyway. So 